What's going on everybody? Today we're doing the buyer's guide for the XJ600 Seika 2. Now, buying a bike from the 90s can feel like you're buying an antique. And with any antique, you wanna make sure it's been well maintained and well properly maintained. So today we're gonna to look at all the common wear items as well as things to look at in an old bike because most of you that'll be buying an XJ like this, it's already very old and possibly neglected for a period of its life. So we're gonna look out for those things and make sure we get you all the pertinent information you need to buy a good XJ600 and not a lemon. Please smash like and subscribe button down below. Now let's go. To check is the brakes. The disc brand new from the factory should be six millimeters thick. The best way to check this is with a micrometer. Micrometer here, I can see that my disc measures 0.215 inches, which works out to be 5.46 millimeters. So we only have about a half millimeter of wear, which is good. The pad thickness also has to be checked. You can get a good eye on it by looking through here. It's difficult to get a good shot of it, but the pad should be between 6.2 millimeters, but no less than 0.8 of a millimeter. You should be able to see the groove in the pad when you look up in there. Also check for scoring and deep grooves on the rotor. This one's seen better days, has a few heat marks, but its thickness is still within range, so that ought to do. Next up is the rear disc. The original thickness is five millimeters, one mil less than the front. Mine measures 4.65, as I can see with my micrometer. When measuring a rotor for its thickness, you wanna check in multiple places. Also check around the cross-drilled holes for cracking or any cracks extending to the edge of the rotor or between the holes. That's a sign of heat and fatigue, and so always check thickness in multiple places and check for holes and cracks. The spec for the rear pad thickness is brand new. They're 5.5 millimeters and they shouldn't be any less than 0.8 of a millimeter. You can see them pretty clearly from the back of the bike here. Next up, check the brake fluid level. You can see you have a sight glass on the front master cylinder here and you shouldn't see any air in it really. You can see I have a tiny air bubble at the top, but it shouldn't be down at the bottom of the sight glass. That would be too low. Rear brake, the rear master cylinder reservoir is a little bit obscured by the plastic, but if you tuck in there, you can see up into there and you can get an idea of whether there's enough fluid in that reservoir or not. When checking the brake fluid levels, have the bike on its center stand on a level surface so you're not throwing off the level of the brake fluid. Next up, let's check the engine oil level on the bike. Here at the bottom of the clutch cover, you have an oil sight glass. Essentially, this is the lower limit and this is the upper limit for the oil level. I have the bike on its side stand right now just so I can get a better viewpoint of it, but you should measure this on a level surface on the center stand and it should be between the two things. It can be hard when the oil is extra fresh and clean because it's hard to see where it is, especially on these grimy old sight glasses, but do your best to have someone maybe rock the bike left to right so that you can find where the level is and then center it on the center stand. You're also supposed to check the engine oil when the bike is at operating temperature. So it's sure it's been on for at least 10 to 15 minutes and the oil is fully heated up to temp. This bike takes 10W40 or 20W40 oil. Now Next thing to check is throttle grip free play. The spec is between three and seven millimeters. The best way to check it is to put some tape across the handlebar plastic to the rubber grip here, cut the tape, and then see how much the tape moves back and forth and measure the distance. One thing to note with old bikes is like this is that the throttle should always spring back. If the throttle rolls and then stays like somehow and doesn't release back to neutral or zero throttle, that's a big dangerous thing. And that often comes from the throttle cables in the bike being seized or just having just contaminants in them that don't allow them to move smoothly. So whenever you check out a bike, always make sure the throttle goes back and returns to zero. Next thing to check is the battery. With the seat off, with the latch on the side, make sure that works as well and you can get the seat up. The battery should be firmly secured by a rubber clamp and it should have at least 12.6 volts sitting here with the ignition off and nothing powering off the battery. So get a multimeter, check the battery. If you're gonna go as far as checking the battery voltage with the seat off and a multimeter, you might as well check the charging volts. So at 5,000 volts, this bike should produce between 14.2 and 15.2 volts. So have someone rev the bike at the throttle, hold it at 5,000 RPM, keep your multimeter on here, and you should see between 14.2 and 15.2 volts. The battery as well should be an eight amp hour battery, nothing less. Next up, you wanna check the chain slack between the midpoint of the front sprocket and the rear sprocket. The spec is between 30 and 40 millimeters of play. So get your ruler out and push the chain up to the as high as it'll go and pull it down moderately firmly. And that range of movement there should be between 30 and 40 millimeters. Other things worth looking at on the chain is how well it fits the sprocket. You should be able to pull back on the chain and it shouldn't lift off more than a half of a tooth showing on the sprocket here. This is a brand new chain and sprocket, so it really doesn't move very far. Also, while you're checking the chain tension, you wanna move the links around and see if you can find any stiff links. Stiff links are a sign of a chain that hasn't been well lubricated or O-rings that are failing on it. 
Also while riding the bike and test riding it out, make sure that it's not ticking. Uh, I've had an old chain before where it makes ticks at speed and a bike shouldn't do that. So make sure you don't hear any regular ticks coming from the chain. It adheres to the sprocket well and no stiff links. Also while you're checking the chain, make sure you check the sprocket. There shouldn't be any hooking or shark's tooth looking features on the sprocket. That's a sign of advanced wear. A more generic thing to check is make sure all your lights work, your left and right turn signals work, they cancel, you've got a high and low beam, and the horn works. Now this has all been well and good and informative about the things to look out for on an old XJ, but let's talk about some of the specific XJ quirks, like the well-known clutch basket rattle. So behind this cover is the clutch and the clutch basket, which holds the friction plates and the steel plates. Behind that clutch basket is the oil pump drive gear, which is affixed to the clutch basket by a pin. Now, Yamaha distributed this bike from the factory with a five millimeter pin, which is slightly undersized for the connection it needs to the oil pump drive gear. What people do is they take the clutch apart, take the basket off and put a 5.5 millimeter pin through the clutch basket so that you get rid of the juddering. The juddering only appears at idle, like at low RPM, under 1500 RPM. It doesn't affect the drivability, but it is a rather pronounced noise. So many people have taken it apart, found using a 5.5 millimeter pin or a 5.5 millimeter drill bit uh, to secure the drive gear to the clutch basket has eliminated the problem. I've got a sound clip of it for you right here. Yeah, so you hear that noise? That's the sound of the juddering clutch. It's not a problem, but it's not very nice on the ears. The XJ being a very old bike, you want to inspect the gas tank for rust. If you've been following my channel, you know I had to cut this open and seal it with Pour 15. So have a look in here, look for any suspicious looking rust because that can be a nightmare of a job. Yamaha implemented this arm here to hold the upper end of the bracket for the rear brake. Make sure all the cotter pins are in place for these nuts and bolts or else you wouldn't want one of those to rattle loose and have this arm come flying off. So check for the cotter pins. Now, as you probably know, the XJ is carbureted. So get your nose out and have a sniff around here for gas fumes. If you see any puddling gas, run away from it. It's a huge fire hazard. Also check that you have a filter in line going to your pump and that you don't see any wet marks around the carburetors. It's really hard to show you, but in here you can see the bottoms of the carburetors. Check for wetness, check for anything out of the ordinary. All the Phillips heads should be intact and not stripped. That's a good sign that it's in good condition and well taken care of. The rubber boots that connect the cylinder head to the carburetor often fail. They just rot out and get cracked and cause a big vacuum leak. I've had to replace this on my bike and it wasn't an easy job. It involves taking everything off. Check around here and check the boots are, well, not dry and flaking off. Check the tires for their production date you can see here this one says 1901 that basically means it was produced in 2019 and the first week of 2019 so the first two digits are the last two digits of the year and the last two digits here denote the 52 weeks of the year so 01 is the first week but like 26 would be the 26th week of the year you can get 10 years out of a tire but most of the time they start to rot out between 7 and 10. Over time, the rubber will dry out and the solvents within the rubber that make it pliable evaporate and leave the rubber. This shows as cracking in the sidewall or in the tread up here. Of course, always check the tire for sufficient tread depth. Find a tread bar in between the treads here and make sure that the tread is proud of that tread bar. This being an air-cooled bike, you want to inspect the fins on the side of the cylinder head and all around the bike to make sure they're not cracked and broken or filled with debris and stuff from the road because this is the only means of cooling off the engine it has. Oil circulation and airflow over the fins. Make sure you get under the bike and check for leak. The head gasket would leak where the cylinder head meets the block, which is right here. And you want to make sure your oil filter or oil pan gasket or drain plug isn't leaking on you because that'd be bad and you leak and smoke on the headers. And that's a wrap for the buyer's guide for this 1992 Yamaha XJ600 Seca2. Of course, they made the XJ600 Seca2 for many years and in many different names under different countries. They called it like the Diversion overseas in the UK. That's where I got these fairings from. They had like a naked version that we didn't get in North America. So this buyer's guide applies to many other bikes within the family of the XJ600. Thanks for watching, everybody. I really hope this helped you out suss out a bike that you're looking at on Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace or something of the sort. If it did help you, please smash the like and subscribe button down below. Thanks for watching. Watching, and as always, have a good day.